today's topic is going to be about how I tier players or teams across esports. And this is an important topic and slightly um, underrated as to how complicated it can get. The reason is because there is no actual standard, uh, even within just one game. So I could say a team is good, but it's ambiguous what I mean by good. Do I mean like good as in overall, like good enough to win a tournament? Do I mean good enough to get in the playoffs? Do I mean good for their level, good for their region? Or sometimes somebody will say something is good, but they actually mean think it's bad. They just say it's good to be nice. And then they kind of like muddy up that word in and of itself, right? So that's why I, I try to be as clear as I can. And this is what this video is about. Just because you want to be able to explain, you want somebody to know immediately, like within a single word, exactly how good, or not exactly, but within the ballpark, of how good you think a team or a player is. So, as I've come from a StarCraft 2 background, I've actually used the Brood War tiers, which is S tier, which is elite beyond elite, A tier, which is like an elite level of player, and then B tier, which are like the good players. As um, I've studied more and more though, I've come to like differentiate a bunch of different like subcategories within each of those tiers. And I'm just going to explain uh, what each of them mean and some examples from like all across the various games I've followed or watched. So the highest tier is S tier. And this is a tier where there is no guarantee there is an S tier player in your game. Uh, even if there is a like consensus number one player. So for instance... Right now in CSGO, the two best teams in the world are FaZe and SK, but neither of them have created enough pedigree, enough results to be considered, at least by me, an S-tier sort of team. And an S-tier sort of team is a team I, 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 I give them a level of bone draw status and or very close to it, which is a player that has like ascended beyond beyond uh, normalcy of even like the top teams. So you can have one S tier player, you can have two, you can even have like five, like in the case of uh, early, early on, earlier on in the five gods era in melee, I'd say there were five S tier players at that time for that game. Right now though, I'd say there's only two, that's Armada and Hungry Box. Everybody else is no longer an S tier player. Beyond that, the other examples I can think of are obviously in Brood War, the uh, Flash, Jadong, Bisu, Stork era. I think all four of them were S tier players. Whereas, like following that uh, in the last throws of Brood War before uh, it got destroyed, Fantasy and Jengbi were pretty clearly like two of the best players in the world. And both of them were in the finals of the last two OSLs, but I never gave either of them S tier status, even though they were probably at least by result, the two best players in the world at that time. Right. Uh, an another example would be Daigo early on in Street Fighter 4 or Infiltration when he first rose up in his first peak uh, or or in early on in Street Fighter 5, like he would be considered an S-tier player for that game for his game. JDCR in Tekken 7 this year obviously a uh, S-tier player because he literally won everything up until the Tekken World Championship where then he lost. So he's like the, he's the only S-tier player of that team of that uh, game. Well, I guess I guess Saint would count too even though Saint like basically lost a bunch of times to JDCR. Nobody else could beat Saint. On the same token, when you go back into like the histories of CS:GO, the obvious S-tier teams in my opinion would be like NIP early on. Then later, it would during the Fnatic era, it's Fnatic, and then it's a bit contentious as to whether or not you want to include the LDLC Envious lineup. I think they were good enough to be given that tier because they could be everybody except Fnatic. So it's a bit iffy for Dota 2. This is a complicated discussion for Dota 2 because the way roster changes have worked and the way the meta changes makes it much more volatile than the other games I watch. 
But the S tier teams I'd pick out throughout history would be early Navi, the one with um, Kuroki and Puppy, old Alliance, the TI winning one, uh, only for like the first year or so of that uh, squad's lifespan. Team DK, uh, the uh, super all star Chinese team, and maybe Vici, uh, the one with Hao, FY, Fenrir, and Super and Ice Ice Ice. I think those are the closest teams to S, to like an S tier sort of uh, rank I give out. And I guess if if you wanted to count like a team that had roster changes but like fundamentally stayed strategically the same, each EG would definitely be there too. So even within like this S tier though, there's like two other sort of criteria you can meet. And that's the level of like the transcendental player. And this is something I've talked about in a previous video about StarCraft 2 where there were four players I considered that to have transcended the game of StarCraft 2. It was MVP, Life, Tasia and Sue, and each of them had done something exceptional in their career that could not be emulated by anybody else. In the same token, um, there are a few CSGO players I'd probably put, I th I think will get there, uh, but the only ones right now, uh, and specifically CSGO, probably be Get Right, Olaf, Cold Zero has basically already done it. I think Nico's pretty close to doing it and simple will do it so those are those those are just off the top of my head there might be a few others but beyond transcendental there's also um there's also the category of what a legendary player is and this is very different from a transcendental player because a transcendental player is a category in which i only re i only count in-game skill or in-game ability or whatever that whatever you want to call all of that and a legendary player is a bit different just because it also includes what you've done for the community, what you represent for the community, and like your overall image. So for instance, in StarCraft 2, a good example is I think everybody knows SOS way more than they know classic or stats. And by that token, he'd probably be considered a legendary player, especially because he had the he had some of the biggest wins in all of StarCraft II history, but if you look throughout the throughout his career against other top Protoss players, like not even like the best ones, just very good ones, elite class ones like Classic or Stats, I'd say both Classic and Stats had better careers than SOS, but neither of them are likely to go down as legendary players in the same right as SOS, just because they don't have the personal like um, image in the community to assign them as much, even though I'd personally say they were both better players than SOS throughout their entire careers, right? And then I guess another example would be, a more controversial one would be the likes of Life or Savior. Both of them were caught match fixing for Life, in Life's case, for a huge amount twice. And then in Savior's case, he had the match fixing scandal thing, uh, match fixing ring. So, it's very up in the air if you want to consider them legendary players or not, but regardless if you consider them legendary or not, you have to tip your hat and say they were transcendental players. They were players that broke their games. They were players that stood above their games in, in unique ways that have never been emulated since they've left. And then below them are the A tier class or the elite class. Now every game has an A tier class level of player or team. These are generally the uh, people you expect to win titles consistently. So, obviously, Jengbi and Fantasy and Brood War, those are like the guys I'd pick at the end of Brood War. I'd say this year for StarCraft 2, Dark, Beyon. Oh, wait, no, Beyond was last year. I'd say it'd be like Dark, Innovation, uh, Sue. Actually, I think Sue would be an S tier but not for this year but for his first year with like Zest when the two of them were on a rampage in 2014 but it's like a different thing and so this is where most of the um, teams and players lie like I think current 
FaZe and SK are both in the A tier class. I think both of them could go into S tier if they start winning a bunch more. Or, like, find a way to outstrip all the rest. Both of them could even go to S class depending on how things turn out results-wise for both teams. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And then in the A tier, there's a, even within an A tier, there's kind of like a class differentiation and have been forced to create it for like a team like Astralis, which is very much on the edge between this tier and then the tier below that, where like Astralis, I don't consider them a championship contender, but they're, they're consistent enough to always be within the top four of any tournament they attend. So it's hard to say that they're not abo- a cut above the rest of the teams below them. And then there's there's a class like that's not really inside. This is like just above the B tier, whereas like the Dark Horses, and this is where I'd put like G2 currently or the old Virus Pro. Um maybe NIP, but I, I don't I don't think there are a lot of different reasons as to why I don't think NIP will will redo their Oakland performance. So I don't, I personally don't put them in that dark horse turn dark horse category, even though they won IEM Oakland against FaZe. And then finally, uh, the B tier class, which are like the good players or the good teams, and they're at they they fill out the rest of the like the top ten or top X amount of players teams, depending on the game you're following. Now, the last bit I'd like to point out is that. What makes an S tier player? Um, what is it that differentiates them from the A class? Because this is the hardest part to distinguish for a lot of reasons, and I'd personally say it's exceptionalism. So you can be the best, but you have to be the best in such a way that it cannot be. It cannot. It cannot be compared to or like you have to break you have to break the rule basically you have to break some kind of crazy fucking rule where you did something that was so incredibly like out of out of out of the nature of the entire game where everybody else has to like bow their head like okay you were the best and you were the best in x way and you were able to like consistently um, do it across a long period of time. I think that's what makes an S tier player. So, for instance, the envious, the one that broke um, the meta with Happy. Yeah, they actually had a style and a strategy that did work, did break the meta, but they uh, eventually tapered off, especially in the uh, Kenny S uh, version of that lineup. So it's hard to say if. So I that specifically that version of the lineup I definitely would not give an S tier status to, but I might have given it to the uh, NV LDLC one because they did break the meta, and they they were really fucking good against every team except for Fnatic, whereas obviously Fnatic would be there because they broke they they broke the game in a sense with their individual skill and their teamwork, and they're like the mid mid round reads that like bring it all together under Pronax. Or like, like I said, the, the entire subject is very muddied, but that's generally how I break down the tiers and stratify players. S rank, A rank, B rank. All right, see you next time.